Welcome to A Flash of Beauty, the podcast, an audio experience dedicated to the further exploration of Bigfoot and the people Bigfoot has revealed itself to. What started as a documentary of personal narrative encounter stories and expert testimony has now shifted into a deeper inquiry into the forever changed lives of those that have witnessed firsthand this hidden truth. My name is Tobe Johnson co-producer of Flash of Beauty Bigfoot Revealed. Join me along with the crew and creators of this doc, director Brett Eichenberger, producer Jill Rimmon Snyder, and cinematographer Michael Ferry, as we go back into the trees to sit down once again with each guest in search of the truth, no matter how strange. All right, back again with me is Jill and Brett. Hello, gang. Hey. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> Guys, it's good to have you back here on the show. And uh, our guest here today is Larry Turner. If you've seen the documentary, then you remember the footage, Larry in the tent. Um, he's he's filled with stories. Uh, boy, oh, boy. And it started a lot earlier than I thought it did. So... Tell me a little bit more about uh, what you guys thought of the interview. Oh, man. Uh, Larry has got some of the best stories I've ever heard. And what's cool for us is his stories all take place about 45 minutes from where we live. So these are like the neighborhood squatches, you know. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a part of the area that we're really familiar with. You know, Jill, of course, growing up on the Oregon coast and myself growing up in the Portland area, these, these are the, the hills that we traverse through our entire lives. So these, like I said, these are the neighborhood squatches that Larry is slowly befriending and or as you'll hear, sharing his breakfast with. Um, <laughs> but uh, this, is, uh, this is definitely the, probably the spookiest moment in the documentary. Um, I know uh, I've seen in some of the screenings, public screenings we've done, I've seen some squirmy people during this uh, segment, and rightfully so. It's pretty frightening. Yeah, and there's some uh, there's some special effects that happen throughout this documentary that, Jill, you're a part of. I won't give them all away. I think I know two scenes in particular where you take on the role of uh, client or patient, and then you take on the role of Sasquatch leaning in, and uh, so, but this is such a well-crafted moment in the documentary. You'd never know it was a, a young lady's hands coming up against the fabric of the tent. Well, cat's out of the bag. And if anyone listening wants my autograph, you can just reach out to me and um, I will talk some sense into you because that would be ridiculous. <laughs> can, can we start a rumor right now that Jill has hands that are twice as big as they should be? Really? She has the opposite of Trump. She's got the large hands instead of the tiny little doll hands. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. Let's this is how the more. rumor. This is how these things start. Uh, these are perfectly see large. Foot hands. size. My gosh. Oh my gosh. Foot size All right. Sixteen shoes. It's weird. Well, you know, you brought up a, the breakfast scene. I want to dig into that a little bit because I, I didn't hear this story early on when I was talking. Uh, t to Larry in the pre-interview, which um, is a helpful way for me to get to know these guests before I actually start talking to them. And he mentioned this egg thing. And um, it's such uh, an important detail that I think a lot of times is left out as far as Sasquatch taking things from people. And, and that's part of the story. I won't give it all away, but... Um, you know, that's why we do these interviews is because there's all these little nuggets as we go through them along the way that, you know, um, lead to a larger type of behavior. And, um, you know, there's a lot going on as far as Larry's evidence is concerned. And we've only touched the tip of the iceberg with these stories. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think I remember Joe Bielart maybe saying some of these same things too. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get Joe on the show, you know, here in the future, but they've had similar experiences with camping. And I know that Joe has an extraordinary story about a close encounter with a, with a Bigfoot um, in the middle of the night, just similar to Larry's. 
So there, there is a pattern that's developing here. You know, I mean, we've got some really interesting clues as to what these beings, what their, what their character is like and what they're comfortable with. And, you know, some of the hijinks that they pull in the middle of the night. And Larry's background, as far as science is concerned, I, I had no idea. I was stupid enough to think he was a meteorologist. He's not a meteorologist. He's a me metrologist. You can go look it up on Google, but he's an expert at measurements, electronic measurements. Um, he has quite a background. We didn't get into his entire background, but he's certified through NASA as far as uh, an acoustics expert and has worked for a uh, place called Medtronics. You kind of know what that is, Brett. I have no idea what that is, but um, that must be an electronics company that specializes. Oh, oh, tech Techtronics. Tech Techtronics. Uh, okay. Yeah. Medtronics. Techtronics is a pioneer in, um, in measurement, so uh, measurement hardware and software. Uh, for those geeks out there, Techtronics is responsible for the invention of the um, waveform vector scope, and they create machines that basically measure, um, you know, like things like televisions, um, you know, I use them in editing to make sure that my colors are correct. Um, high end medical devices need to be calibrated, um, nonstop, you know, to make sure that they're functioning correctly. And so they do a lot of that kind of stuff. They've been around here in the Beaverton slash Portland area for 50 or 60 years. And I think I can mention this. He he worked on the Cassini satellite project out in White Sands, which is no small accomplishment. He said there are certain things that he couldn't talk about. So um, he's not just beating the brush in the Tillamook Forest, you know, throwing back a bush light. He's he's a man of science. And, uh, you know, for me, it's uh, it's always good to meet these guys because, uh, again, we have a real blunt speaker that uh, – you know, has these profound experience with Sasquatch and knows how to take notes along the way here. So um, I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. Uh, Jill, Brett, any last comments before we get into it? No. <laughs> no. I think you guys are going to really enjoy it. Make sure uh, and listen to this on your way to camping. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Our interview with Larry Turner. Larry Turner. Hey. Hey. All right, we're back here, and in full honesty, it sounds a little different here. I think it's going to sound good. It's a good setup that we have, but we're here with Brett and Jill in their living room, and we're doing a second interview with Larry because guess who forgot to hit the record button? That would wasn't be me. me. Oh, sorry. It wasn't Brett. It wasn't Jill. They're seasoned pros. It certainly wasn't Larry. And I guess there's a first time for everything. But now we know it's recording. And out of the goodness of Larry's heart, here we are in the living room surrounded by good art. And Brett and Jill, thank you for opening your house here. You're welcome. Welcome to our house. <laughs> we always yeah. open up our house. And you guys house. aren't even copying an attitude. Like, you could easily be like, yeah, whatever. Well, let me cop one. Yeah. <laughs> but it's never happened that recording Laura to, to hit the recording button. The little red light's flashing, but you didn't hit it again. I hit it record. after you left, in all honesty, and that's so what So what he did <laughs> is for the hour that we and 25 minutes that we were talking, mm -hmm. after it was done, he hit record. Yeah. <laughs> it was a dress rehearsal. Yeah. Just yes. think of it as a dress rehearsal. And, and yeah. all those things that you said, you said you'd never repeat. Like, no. So right. now it's lost. <laughs> Secrets. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I deserve um, it. I had a glass of wine that evening. Maybe I had more than a couple glasses oh, after that. But um, somebody should be fired. Truth is out. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to fire myself. Oh, well, there you go. He fired himself. Well, we hired you back. Welcome, so, Tob. Let's get the show on the road. I appreciate yeah. it totally. The second time's a charm. Um, I drove down here from Port Orchard. I'm sitting here with you guys. I'm excited to actually be able to do this again because of the fact that we're sitting next to what I think are authentic Sasquatch handprints. And if anybody knows anything about the documentary, you know the Larry Turner scene. 
if the woman you remember well, go back and rewatch it where Larry is, I want to say manhandled, but we're not quite sure. We're going to cranial call it a massage. A cranial massage <laughs> by the hour. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about not only the cranial massage, but I guess let's just go back to the origins here for the first 10 or 15 minutes here. Talk about Larry's intro into the world of Sasquatch and how it started for you. Well, in 2000, I'm going to start at 2012 and then go back to uh, 1980. So in 2012, I, my two adult daughters um, and their girlfriends went out camping. And I raised my daughters to know their animals and, and the wilderness. I've had them on the back country of uh, Glacier uh, National Park in Montana. We were out there for three weeks. We've been very dangerous campgrounds. One was called Mini Glacier Campground where it had a uh, four by eight sheet of plywood painted with a sign that said, warning to all campers, campers have been and will be killed in this campground because of the population of grizzly up there. We chose this campground because of its remoteness, one, and two, the high mountain lakes in the area that uh, contain some of the largest brook trout I've ever seen. And so we would hike these trails along the, the uh, um, blueberries, if you will, and get to these lakes and just fish and then come back and have the fish for dinner. About day three, we were ran off the trail by a ranger on a horse that said that uh, uh, a sow grizzly took down a moose a quarter mile away from our camp. <laughs> so, you know, here we are walking along with fish. You know, but be as it may, we were safe. And then I'm at, I've had them up in Yellowstone. We've done back country up there. Um, again, you got wolves running through Yellowstone, uh, and then you've got the, the uh, bear, right. grizzly, and black bear. So a lot of time outdoors with them, so they know their animal. Going back to that day in August, their first night, um, as they told me when they got home, they would tell me about these strange whoop calls, and my middle daughter makes a real good sound, uh, real good mimic of it. And because of uh, my uh, octave range, I couldn't, I can't hit that tone. <laughs> but it was like whoop, and we'll go whoop. And then do it again for 20 minutes directed straight down at their camp. Uh, that happened about what, 10, 10 o'clock at night for about 20 minutes or, no, that was the second night, maybe two hours is what they mentioned. And then the second night it happened again about the same time, about 10 o'clock and then for 20 minutes until one of them yelled, knock it off, Bigfoot. <laughs> And it stopped. <laughs> so my daughters are tell, relaying the story when they come back. And it was like, uh, you know, was, was it barred out? Said, no, Dan's not barred out. They, 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 no, it wasn't this. I went through all the animals, including the fox, because they have a repertoire of different sounds. And no, it wasn't that. Definitely wasn't a coyote. And it really had my... Uh, curiosity peaked and kind of huh Bigfoot was not really on my mind at that time it was more like well I gotta hear this for myself to see what it is so I was talking with my boss Mark and told him about that and I said you want to go camping up there for Friday he goes well sure so that Friday the following weekend we went up there set up our, tent, our tents, and he had his 14-year-old uh, daughter with him, and um, we ate dinner. I grilled up some fresh-caught uh, silver salmon, so the scent of salmon's in the air, you know, all that stuff. 
And then we, um, and again, during this time, Frank Bigfoot just started coming along the line. So we decided to walk around the perimeter of the campground. There's a road that goes all the way around the perimeter of it. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, probably take 30 minutes to walk around real slow. So we got out to the main power line road and I found the, the big stick that was laying there. I was like, huh, you know what? Let's go pound on these power lines, uh, poles, and give it a couple knocks and we'll see what happens. So I go over there, pound, Mark has no clue, none. He goes, what are we doing this? I said, well, I, I watched this show and so I explained it to him. He goes, really? Yeah. So we walked back. I left the stick there. Walked back. Then we'll, by that time, it's about 10 o'clock, and the daughter's tired, and she goes to bed. So Mark and I are sitting at the fire, and we're checking out the satellites and the stars and just being real quiet. Well, the next thing you know, I'd say probably maybe 20 minutes, we were sitting there just being still. All of a sudden, bat, 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 bat! Right where we were, exactly where we knocked, on that power line, pole, our knocks coming. There isn't nobody out there. Zero. Zero people, because it, it's so octave out there, you could hear people uh, people for miles even driving in. And we're kind of going, we both stand up, and I go, there's nobody out here. Mark goes, I know. I'm going, WTF. He goes, I know. And then right I would say probably five or six seconds later, we get a Ohio type of, of howl coming in from the north. It was so powerful that reverberated in your chest. Now, the interesting thing was, is while this was going on, little known to me is Mark had a camera with the, with the audio recorder in it. He hit record as soon as he hit, heard those knocks. So he told me about that. He he goes, I think I got a recording. I went, what? He goes, yeah, I got this one. Oh, cool. He goes, yeah. Well, during that time when the knocks, between the knocks happened and the two howls that came at us, his daughter was trying to get out of the tent because I'm jacked up now. I was like, oh, oh that is so cool. They do exist. You know, that type of thing. And then she was like, I want to get out of here. I want to get out of here. I want to get out of here. And I was like, no, shut up. Shh. You know, but anyway, that experience right there hooked me in a way. I was like, I got to know more. And it was every weekend for six years going back and forth through there until I started logging and messed everything up. Well, over a decade now. And I, we've got lots of prints and mm -hmm. uh, my head grab that happened like uh, the following year uh, and, uh, same location that this happened where the sounds came out of generally generally because okay. that was actually about a half a mile away from there okay uh, where I got my head grabbed and no one on the plant knew where I was at that time right I was by myself with my daughter's dog mm -hmm. But uh, now I'll go back to 1980. So in uh, November of 1980, I was out elk hunting. And uh, there used to be a road that went between from Hague Lake all the way to Highway 6 that's now burned off. It's been closed for decades where you can't trespass or go in. And Simpsons Lumber Company got that through a land swap with the state of Oregon. Okay. Used to be state forest. So I was up there hunting before any of this even happened. And uh, I knew where Elkhurst was. And so I parked my truck up on the main line road and I uh, walked down this uh, road that led to a landing, bailed off the landing, and started heading to the new clear cuts that you could see that goes on to the horizon of new clear cuts and stuff looking for elk. 
So I waited uh, for daylight and started slowly moving my way along. And, you know, I think maybe two or three ridges over, I found a herd of elk and had a real nice bull in one of them. And uh, it was a six by six. You know, and me and, so I started, you know, trying to stealthily move in. The wind was right, it was going in my face. And uh, for some reason, the elk was super skittish that day and just kept on moving. And I could never really catch up. I enjoy stalking. I mean, I could have took it out from 400 yards away, but I don't like doing that. I might want one bullet, one shot, one kill. So I wanted to get ahead of them and just wait for the bull to come to me. Well, I could never get ahead of them because they were like on the move, moving fast for whatever reason. So, say about three hours later, I kind of like gave up. I said, okay, time, I'm gonna go back. I'm a long ways away from my truck. And so I turned around, you know, and I couldn't even see where Mainline was. I just knew the general direction. And so I started walking uphill. Well, to my left of me, uphill I found, well to the right I found this uh, uh, an opening in, in the woods and I noticed oh it's a skid road, a real old one could have happened uh, you know during the Tillamook burn uh, were, uh, were from one of the forest fires during that time but it was a definite old road but it had like boulders in it and stuff but it wasn't one anybody could drive down but I could sure navigate better than walking and tripping yeah. and falling over through clear cut stuff. And so I started walking up that road, and, and to my left, about 30 yards, was this uh, brush. Kind of like, uh, I'll just call it brush. It had some slough in it, some other stuff. It was maybe 15 to 20 feet tall kind of thick, patchy type of brush. And I, for whatever reason, would, you know, have a look every, every once in a while up that way. About midway uphill, I was like, huh, I don't feel right. Something's wrong. And uh, hair was standing back my neck, and I was like, well, what is wrong with me? I've actually felt nervous, and I never feel nervous in the woods. To a point, I was so nervous that I jacked around uh, from my 30 out 6 and put one in the chamber because I felt like I was in danger for whatever reason. Oddly enough, I wouldn't do that around a bear or a cougar. So I just could not shake that weird feeling. I didn't smell anything. I didn't see anything at that time. I just didn't feel right. And there's no one who knows where I'm at in the other time. And the deal was is that with that 30 out 6 and 180 green bullet, I'm the biggest, baddest thing out there. I could pretty much put down anything. And I'm walking along and all of a sudden I see from the peripheral vision of my left eye something black in that brush 30 yards away. I'm, and I stopped for a second and I'm going, is that a bear? I'm looking, because I got a bear tag. I'm like, I'm stoked. I was like, good, I can get a bear. So I start looking, and I'm take a step, it takes a step. And I still can't discern if it's a bear. So let's say we play, I play this game for like five minutes. And I'm looking. And while I take a step, it's taking a step. And I'm seeing flashes of its leg. That ain't no bear leg. What is that? And this was going on for about five minutes. And while I'm walking, and again, it would take a step almost identical to mine. 
It's mimicking me. The next thing I know, it does this. As I'm walking uphill, it's taking the steps. I'm seeing knees. I'm seeing partial leg right down to about the calf area. And a partial hip. As I'm walking uphill. I'm a little nervous now. You don't say. <laughs> yeah. And I'm kind of like breaking a sweat. And I'm not going very fast because I'm going, what is that? That is no bear. It dawned on me, say about 15 minutes into this scenario, was it doing, Ugh! and it stayed in the brush walking this way. That, it's not a bear. A black bear would never parallel you. Never. They discover what you were, and they're out of there. Black bears are very timid. They, unless they're uh, running into a starvation situation, they'll never, ever par parallel you, nor will the cougar. They usually will. I've been uh, buff charged by black bears many times, and they've come out of nowhere, and then they stop and they're stiff in the air because their eyesight sucks. They'll be up, they'll be standing all two feet, you know, five feet, five, ten feet from me, just sniffing the air, going, what are you, what are you? And once they realize you're there, they bounce, and they're out of there fast. <laughs> this thing over here, 20 or 30 yards to my left, is not a bear. Pause. I want to talk about that because I know there's people in the audience that are going to be curious about what you just said about the paralleling. Parallel, yeah. Yeah, that's something that you hear over and over again. It paralleled me. It mimicked what I did. It stopped when I stopped. It walked when I walked. Mm -hmm. And you're saying there is nothing of that size out here that will do that, that will mimic you and parallel you. Some people say escort you. Um, back to your truck, back to your campsite, off the road. Uh, what about, would a grizzly do that? Would Absolutely it? not. Grizzlies are the same way except for one exception. They, they do bluff charges. Mm -hmm. They will attack if there's cubs, but, uh, but they, give you, they give you a chance for escape. They give you a chance to leave your area. That's, but uh, they will not parallel you. They're top apex predators. They're full bore. They're just coming. They're, they co they're coming from me. You're on the menu. And they're not out here. We don't. We have don't have grizzlies here. Yeah. No. Yeah. And then if we did have one singular incident of a grizzly, it dead. wouldn't be a breeding population of activity mm -hmm. saying this explains all paralleling of people that say they have and this no. is bipedal paralleling right, right. and you got mm -hmm. and the color is wrong yeah okay. grizzlies are usually tan dark brown i've never ever seen a black grizzly and at this point you smell nothing no sir the air yeah. is going the wrong way gotcha no. okay all right go ahead so the air was going north and south mm -hmm. but it switched because it was in my back now and so crosswind, there were no crosswinds, so there was no scent. Um, it wasn't up until recently I was able to smell what a Bigfoot smells like. I've never smelled them before. So up until just like less than a month ago um, in wow. Washington. Wow. So other than that, I've never had well, What did it smell like? People are going to want to know that. All right. I, this is going to sound weird. Imagine a skunk dumped in the most rancid gar garbage you could find, and it's all soaking wet, whatever this garbage is, wrapped in skunk and mink oil. Combine that with a dead fish, dog crap, and everything else, and let it rot for a week. <laughs> That's a cologne for some. That yeah. really should be. It is a, a musk. Larry's uh, musk. Uh, <laughs> yes. Brought to you by. I'll, but, do, uh, I'll do Sasquatch. But it, it's a it's a musk that actually permeates, if uh, not, not permeates, radiates around, away from the subject, a good mm -hmm. ten to fifteen yards. 
in all directions. Because the first time I've ever smelled it, I was inside of a tent. Mm. And I knew it was there because I heard it walking. I smelled grizzlies, mm. I smelled uh, black mm. bear, me warm. The interesting thing that you gotta remember about scent is it invokes memory. Mm -hmm. um, powerful scents like this also you never forget. Um, and in my scent repertoire, in my memory, I've never smelled a scent like that in my life, ever. So I have to conclude it's not bear, it's not skunk, it's not fox, it's mm -hmm. not coyote, it's not wolf, it's not porcupine, it's not anything. Even owls have a certain scent. It's not cougar, mm -hmm. uh, none of this. And I'm sure you've had a lot of run-ins with skunks too, probably. Oh yeah. With dogs and stuff. I've had, yeah, that. And, uh, I've had almost every single animal out in the forest come walk straight up to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, bobcat and lynx, too. Have mm -hmm. you ever smelled a corpse? Yes, I have. And did it have any similarities no, to No, it did a, not. A I dead mean, animal, a, corpse, a dead uh, body, or a, a dead... A corpse has a, uh, especially one in decomp, um, <clears throat> it's an unusual scent. There is a a, a rotting type of smell, but with a pineish, uh, pine salt type of, of uh, blend to it. It's very strange and pungent. Um, it's nothing pleasant, okay? Nothing, not even close. I've been okay. around a few corpses in my day. Let's, uh, the, the audience is going to want to know how and why, but maybe we keep that a mystery, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is actually finding uh, dead relatives. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, because people do describe the smell of death mm -hmm. with with That's this it. odor. It is, it is a, not. It's not. Though. No, it is okay. not. Okay. That's not what you smell. Okay. No, not even right. in that neighborhood. We had a when I was in high school, we had a skunk get in a fight with a cat in our garage, mm -hmm. and I remember that smell as being eye watering. It actually hurt. It was actually mm -hmm. a painful smell. Mm -hmm. would, would, would you describe your, the Bigfoot smell in that kind of vicinity? No. It wasn't the kind because like it's like a skunk makes you want to leave the vicinity. I've got to understand something about scent. <clears throat> There's two components. One is just their musk, if you will, or how they smell, animal smell. There's three components, actually. Um, there's also a pheromone component, and with that scent also is, you know, um, plants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they have um, the regular scent, which is like, uh, well, let's talk canines. Canines have a scent that's on their skin or on their fur. They have anal glands, okay, and they have pheromones. Combine that, that is your unique scent. For the species, mm -hmm. and you know, for the, uh, the, and then the smell of the skin and the pheromone is individual. It tells you status, it, it, it's so much language and scent that people don't realize. Um, it's a hidden language, yeah. and, and you gotta understand it. Uh, not many people think in these terms. Mm -hmm. It's like with elk. They smell like horse. Hmm. But you can tell the difference between a bull elk and a cow elk. There's a subtle difference between their scents. Um, you know, because bulls, they pee all over themselves. Um, elk have scent glands at the, at the base of, of, near their feet. It's hard to explain, but there's a big scent gland. Same with deer. Deer smell like a honey musk type of smell. Um, again, it's more stronger than mm -hmm. uh, But elk smell horsey. But you could identify a lot of animals once you're around these scents. Mm -hmm. Like this, and it's like if a deer or elk went through an area, you could go behind them five days and know that they were here. Hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. But when you're being paralleled, you smell none of this. Nothing. 
do so it. So what happened next? He fall I, again. We were heading up the hill. <clears throat> Are we? I <laughs> and whatever the royal that black thing is with legs is walking up the hill. Still behind the tree, I am. He, he's I. He's in this brush stuff. Mm -hmm. And taking steps as I'm taking steps, making that <laughs> noise consistently aimed at me. So I decided to double time it. It double times it. Go up the hill. Now I'm 23, 20, 21 years old, so I'm not out of shape. You know, I'm booking up this hill. This thing's parallel to me. I'm fine. I finally. I saw a knee with an arm, with a hand go by it. I'm going, okay, that's not a bear. And it's like, oh, I, I, I got nothing, zero. So this went on, I'll say two miles, or however it takes to take from two miles, going up about a 30 degree incline up to the main line road. And I'm trying not to trip and fall over the the the, the rock and stuff that's up that I'm going up on this uh, skid road. And as soon as I saw the opening, it's still following me, still doing its thing. Again, a knee, a long leg. I did not see its foot. I did not see its torso. I did not see the head. All I saw was hands and a good portion of legs, you know, and knee. The whole entire time is it stayed hidden in this brush, making that sound. Mm -hmm. And when I got up on Mainline Road, I slung my rifle and I ran the 300 yards to my truck, which was north. Got in my truck and I peeled it out of there. And I have never been back. That was 1980. Now, and now 2023. One of the reasons I'd never been back, it wasn't shortly afterwards that they burned off the road on both ends. And it is now private timber company. You can't enter it without their special permission or you get fined, you know, and jail or whatever penalties they have on their stupid signs. And the interesting thing about this moving forward to 2013 is I didn't tell a soul about that incident for all that time. Why, you might ask? Well, in 1980, I didn't even tell my wife. Who do you tell? Who do you explain this to? Who would believe you? So. I just chalked it up as that's a ten on my strangle meter. <laughs> How do you know? Did you know any other hunters or people who spent time in the woods who'd ever had an encounter or talked about weird things? Nope, and I didn't talk about it with anybody, not even my closest friends. Um, and <clears throat> it wasn't a protective thing on my part. It was like who would understand? <clears throat> now you know, guys. If I told Brent and Tobe this back in 1980, they were my buddies, what do you think they would do? Laugh their asses off and tell me I'm insane. <laughs> well, probably not these two guys, but other yeah. guys. Our friends yeah. would have. Yeah. That, that's the <laughs> we point. would have been like, where? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. no, you didn't yeah. know anything, period? I, well, but I was always looking for crazy shit. And so for well, me, yeah. I would have been your guy, but I get your point. Yeah. yeah. The, the, and this is why people don't talk is for that very reason. The question that I have is, if you never saw a head and you never saw his eyes, how is he looking at you and watching you? Because in order for you to, for him to see you, you would need to see him looking at you, right? Right. Now, the thing is, is that remember, I saw patches. Uh, there were patches and openings. Mm-hmm. And because of my position, I was higher, a little bit higher than he was. Okay. And, but the brush got thicker the taller it was. And so he probably had way more chances of looking at me than I did to him. Because I couldn't see down into it 
And again, I'm caught one eye to the left, one eye to the right, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, you know, I got things I got that's going on. The biggest thing that I didn't want to do was trip and fall mm -hmm. uh, because <laughs> A, I'm covering a 30 out six, that what happens if I fall and for whatever reason around comes out of that chamber. It's irresponsible. The other thing is, is the biggest rule of hunting is know your background, know your backdrop, so you don't uh, hurt someone mm -hmm. or something downrange. A lot of things can, that I consider when I'm out carrying a firearm or even out in the, in the wild. Larry, did you consider it was a person at any time? Not one. A bit. weirdo following you, a big dude. No, no, no. That was not. That was not a human. Not in any way, shape, or form. And why it could, could it, not move? There's yeah, no why, way. Why do you say that? Because in that stuff there, I actually tested a little bit of, of, of an area while I was walking uphill that looked similar like that. I couldn't walk through it. So just the terrain, I, the navigating the terrain was bullshit. There's no way. No way. I mean, it, what about it, what you saw? The hand, the knee. Was there anything that mimicked it being a human? No, because it was all black, and the hand was massive. the The legs were huge, when, especially when you saw the uh, musculature and the flexing of the muscles of from the calf to the upper part, you know, mm -hmm. the kneecap and stuff were ginormous. Mm -hmm. It would take two of my legs to make one. Gotcha, twice as big. And, well. and now I'll go back to bear again. The legs aren't that big. They're short, especially the ones they stand on. Just take a look at a picture of a bear standing on his uh, two feet and you'll see the size of the, their short legs then the other, the other ones are like, you know, kind of right. down in front of them. Um, it, <laughs> I'm, kid, I'm telling you, these, these legs are ginormous compared to a bear. Again, every time I'm out in the woods, especially when you deal with, with, with the, this phenomena that we're talking about, mm -hmm. I use nature 100% to try to explain everything because there's so many examples of nature that you could refer to. So I'm back checking always. It's like when I do my audio stuff, I go to Macaulay Library of Sound and I start looking. Mm -hmm. I take the best nuggets of my stuff, I send to wildlife biologists, what is this? Mm -hmm. And I get, I got no clue. I've never heard anything like that. I don't, I've never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. And remember, um, for those of us that do audio, it's not so much listening. I'm a metrologist by trade. That my science that I deal with is in, uh, has been in audio. I, I word audio generation of signals and audio analysis using hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of equipment, the highest end spectrum analyzers where I could take from the high, the fundamental of the frequency all the way down to its lowest component of the harmonics and evaluate each frequency and split that out from its, from, mm -hmm. from its harmonic down to the next level of harmonics you can't even see down to the quasi peak. You're talking down so, so far down in the mud. That, would go down into, uh, uh, ultra, uh, you know, infrasound, mm -hmm. down that far. Mm -hmm. And infrasound's mm -hmm. always in the environment. A lot of people always go, how come you don't study the infrasound? Well, you have to learn how to know that out. You have to do a study in one area alone mm -hmm. to know out all the infrasound that's natural and the infrasound that's man-made that's coming from the sea because infrasound travels so far. And it's not worth my time. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's not enough examples in nature. I mean, elephants make infrasound, tigers make infrasound. I'm sure, our, you know, some of our big cats do. People talk about being zapped and they're attributing to infrasound. Mm -hmm. I say, prove it. 
did you see a Bigfoot make a, a facial uh, gesture that put out a sound that you can't right. audibly hear? It's monkey fingers to its yeah. head, programming <laughs> uh, out an imaginary mean, beam. It's basically, uh, even even with this, this audio, I mean, most of the audio mm-hmm. we get tonight, right? Yeah. So, scientifically... Have you experienced this? Have audio? you experienced something close to what people describe as infrasound? No. Okay. Not a bit. I, I, I'm not sold on it. But you felt something. You said it reverberated. Well, that's because of the amplitude. Yeah. Uh, you the, don't think it has anything problem. to do with the the angle? It was pointed at you? Could be. But I'm, I'm, I'm attributing it more to amplitude. Okay. Because these were insane a lot. When you play those two audios, mm-hmm. the first one's from Mark and I, you're mm-hmm. not going to get the amplitude because it was our camera recorder. The second one, well, let, here, let's edit that in. I'm going to play that audio for the people right now. So we just played the audio here. You don't believe that's infrasound taking place? You don't no, think because it was audible. Correct. The other, the other uh, audio, again, now this, this audio that you're going to be playing mm-hmm. was what the BFRO folks Mark and Mark and I. Um, the recorder's sitting 12 feet up in a tree. They're going to hear wind mm-hmm. because it's sitting up so far. And the fascinating thing is when you hear this audio, it's picking it up from a co- over uh, about a half a mile away, maybe uh, three quarters, uh, three qu- a half a mile to uh, a little over a quarter of a mile, somewhere mm-hmm. in that range. And you're going to hear the amplitude. You're also going to be able to hear the acoustics mm-hmm. of the area between them. Now, the, the fascinating thing when you hear this audio, you, uh, there are two subjects that are calling back and forth. One to the left, one to the right. The left being east, the one to the right going west. Okay. okay? Down this canyon. It's an acoustic area. During this, paying paying very close attention, you're going to hear a ballad. And what I mean by a ballad is there's song in this, not like you and I would be singing. It, this isn't whatever called language, or it's not anything you're going to discern as language, but a a call in a singing tone, for lack of a better term. And you, I would let the listeners come to their own conclusions, but uh, it's off the hook, and I think you guys will like that too. What is it about them possibly singing that you think? may, um, I guess, throw a, a monkey wrench in the situation. Well, I don't, I don't have any problem with them singing. I mean, uh, I've been around uh, a lot. I mean, I've heard them, you know, mm-hmm. uh, talk. I've heard them, you know what they say, samurai chatter? Uh-huh. I've heard them talk about, uh, now, we people, Yeah. Talk that it's more of a patriarchal society. Right. I happen to believe that. When you hear the mm-hmm. big alpha in a in a bunch of hooping and hollering because they just killed something. Well, why do I say that? Because I we listened. It was four of us. Listen to them come from the east, going down a mountain, through clear cuts, and then ended up in that. Uh, acoustic area I was explaining about and all of a sudden there's like five or six whoops whooping 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 mm-hmm. going on and all of a sudden right in the middle of that like, hey, like it's dead it stopped now this came from a big male voice that's exactly what it sounded like and to me in my primal mind 
-hmm. my primal mind said, okay, it's dead, give me the liver. Oh, really? Mm. Wow. Wow. That's in my primal mind. Well, now, wait a second. <laughs> Your primal mind is detecting a behavior of a hunt with a hierarchy going on to the point where you're asserting how they're hunting and when they're calling the hunt off. That's one hell of a primal mind. I've been in the woods a lot. <laughs> and yeah. that, again, that's my primal mind. And uh, Is there something more than primal mind happening? Do you ever think of that? Like, was there something else that Larry knew? I knew you were hunting. You did? I knew that yeah. for a fact uh, because they were pushing something. It sounded to me like they were... I, I, okay. Again, I've had a lot of experiences. I know the hunt. Okay? It was organized. Two were up high. Mm -hmm. Put on a, I, It has to be a deer because there are no elk in this area. Or maybe a, a, a couple... They usually travel in fours, the deer up in that area. Usually uh, a, um, a older female, her two-year-old uh, two daughter, maybe some twins, you know, this year's twins. They usually stay in little fours. So, assuming that, mm -hmm. from what I know, the ant wildlife that are in these areas, and coming from where it was, where I knew where the deer frequented, um, any animal that's trying to do an escape is going to do what? They're going to try to evade the predator, for one. They're going to take the path of least resistance, for two. Well, going downhill is the least resistance, right? So while this is going on, you got the two whooping up to the east and was joined like 15 minutes later, with two more sets of whooping going on, and then, you know, five minutes later, there's four sets of whoopings going on, and then all of a sudden, the middle, the big, and then it's total silence. I could take it to that stretch and go to my primal mind and think, okay, right, they killed something. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you said some things here that sound familiar to me. People go different directions and then they stop at a certain area and say, oh, I'm not going to go there. But, um, you know, when the thing was paralleling you, you said it was directing its vocalization Straight at you. Straight at me. Yeah. And that's interesting. Do bears do that? Do they send no. a... a a huff sound towards they do prey. They do. I think. Well, I, I've been huffed at by a bear, but mm -hmm. they do mostly the weird, lippy, chattery thing. Like uh, a clicking. There's or a, a mouth clicking popping? of the mouth popping, yeah. clicky thing. It's mm -hmm. a way of communicating. It's usually uh, a lot of times that I've experienced is mm -hmm. uh, they do that out of nervousness. See, cats do that, too. I was watching our feral cat. When they see a bird, and this is kind of getting off subject from the bear, but there is something about popping or clicking or... The chattering. They, yes, oh, they yeah. do this weird chatter right before cats they do that. Yep. get attacked or get nervous. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe yeah. that's a Bigfoot thing, too. I don't know. I mean... Yeah, we don't know. Or, um, and then people mm -hmm. always ask, you know, I'm, I do things out in the woods that very few people do. And I've learned through the years. Mm -hmm. First of all, the woods is my second, it's actually my first home. And what do I mean by that? We all come from that environment. Mm -hmm. We come into, we've created now an artificial environment that is alien to our well being. Right now, where we're sitting, we are surrounded by frequencies, man-made frequencies that are detrimental to our balance. So, we got 60 hertz of electricity running through here. When it goes on the TV, it's 120 hertz. This recorder here is also emitting a frequency. Um, all sorts of EMF going on over here. 
We are our balanced creatures. And the only way to get back into balance is to return to nature, which I do. And the first thing you got to do is slough that off. And what do I mean by that? It's called the decompression. Just like you're a diver and you're coming up in the depths and you have to take your three-stage uh, decompression positions in water so that you don't get the bends. Right. Most of us, using those terms in today's society all over the world have got the bends. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know how to decompress anymore. I decompress when I go out in the woods. That means leaving everything, letting everything go. And it's really, it's natural for me, but mm -hmm. if you were to say I went feral, I would know you were there and you would never ever ever see me mm -hmm. never you would never know i was there the people should know because I, we track you on social media larry we see you out in the woods uh lake bound every day slaying trout so as someone escaping <laughs> well but you do bring your phone because i know you're updating but um well, i do something while i'm waiting for the fight <laughs> <laughs> but i what i'm wondering is this your personality, your background, your mindset, which is, you know, you're kind of going back to your roots as someone who believes that we came from the ground and you want to be from the ground and live in the forest. Um, do you think that that puts you in a place to where a moment like what happened in the documentary, you have something approaching you so close that it brings its hand up to the fabric of the tent and it doesn't hurt you. You, you. you say in the documentary you didn't know if this thing was going, what it was going to do to you. I'm sure you had <clears throat> images of that since then. Describe to people a little bit about that moment and the time that we had left. Well, when it was, Again, I don't know where you want to start, but I was tore up by my dog as it had enough. Well, you're in a hot spot. Uh -huh. You're a big footer, right? Whether or not you like that term or not, you're in a location. Are you squatching at that time? Are you there because you know it's a damn hot spot and you want to get a little the both? Sand? But I was just my, you know, the chill. I'm getting the, yeah. The deal is with me. I'm a camper first. Uh, yeah, but you're always Bigfoot, aren't you? Uh, well, yeah, but that's... Um, that's <laughs> yeah. How would I put that? I'm a camper first. Yeah. Bigfoot is always running in the background noise. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, at any time, that switch can come on. Mm -hmm. And then I'm Bigfoot. But the difference between that really isn't anything. Because I believe with all my heart if you go look for Bigfoot, you're never going to find them. Mm -hmm. There's other components, but if you act as a camper and act natural, mm -hmm. that's when things happen. But I'm going to take that a step further. That being is your <clears throat> demeanor. What do I mean by that? If, I, if I'm hunting a deer or elk, and they see me, are they gonna run or are they gonna stand there? 90% of the time during, and I'm archery hunt, so I can go out, I can go out in, you know, in the summer. The thing is that they observe. In nature, nature observes nature. It's the same th principle as like when wolves, when they run through a, a, um, an elk herd, the same with grizzlies when they run through an elk herd, you could look at that elk herd and I watched it right in front of me, watch a grizzly walk and zigzag right through an elk herd and they didn't even move. And then it exploded. Covered 30 yards in three, you know, less than three seconds, I mean, incredibly fast. And was on this bull elk like it was nothing. nothing. It broke its neck right there. You know, full grown grizzly and a full blown 6.0. Why am I saying this? 
observation, okay? <clears throat> Demeanor. They're even scent, for that matter. Again, we exude scents. We have a demeanor while we're out in the woods. Um, it's a, something that you have to learn. And the animals do the same thing. If they see me walking through the woods and I find my hunter, mm -hmm. they know my intent. So what are they going to do? They're going to buck. Mm -hmm. So that's why we as men, we got to think about our windage. Mm -hmm. uh, as an archery hunter, I got to think about my yardage, stocking, stealth. Okay? Then the wolves will do the same thing stocking or the stealth. Uh, of course, wolves run down their prey. But the whole, the whole deal is, is that going back to Bigfoot and his demeanor. Um, I believe that they look at demeanor and pick up demeanor. Mm -hmm. And that means if you got a calm altitude, if you're more peace mm -hmm. in, in your environment, not nervous or jittery, uh, they're more attracted to that. Like autistic kids, look it up, listen to stories. They are attracted to, to that. Uh, they love being. They are attracted to the female voice. Mm -hmm. um, Again, there could be, um, the voice could be part of the component. It could be that there's a more, you know, I'm not in danger type of thing, going back to your primal moves. mind, the yeah. pheromones, the whole nine. Um, but demeanor is everything. So you put yourself in the demeanor as a participant of the woods, in this case a camper, you're going to a hot spot, but in the back of your mind, you're like, well, I'm camping, I'm camping maybe nothing will happen. So I don't any, have any expectations because yeah. it's on them. Right. But you know you're in a hot spot. Mm -hmm. You probably had experiences and other people around the same area. You're there with your dog. It's the, what time do you get there? Are you there first thing in the morning? Are you there after work? Oh, uh, well, that was, let's see that. Well, that's when I was working. So I got there after work. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed my daughter's dog and then we took off. Okay. You know, but I get off, you know, I'm a pretty early guy, so I got work one thirty, so I'm up there before 3 p.m. Okay. But now, in And my this new is not an established campground, we should say. Oh, no. You're not there at 3 p.m. because the hotel room keys are oh, oh. locking the door. You're in the middle of the woods. This the, was a landing. Rush. Yeah. You know, I make my own hotel. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And nowadays, it's like, because I have time, it's like, I'll get there be just in daylight. Well, I like, I love being out in the woods, and mm -hmm. the daylight, I mean, just in daylight, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Watching the sun break through the, mm -hmm. the woods, the, the bird choir, all the animals. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Who wouldn't want to be up there and listen to that stuff? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get your tent down. Is it a single-man tent? It's a three-man uh, Nemo. Okay, three-man Nemo, mm -hmm. meaning what? It's a pop-up tent? What's a Nemo? It's a pop-up okay. tent. Okay, just a regular... Regular tent. Poles. A, yep, poles. But you're not like in a canvas shelter. You're oh, heck no. Mine's a little yeah. tiny three-man tent. Yeah, because you know? in the dock, it looks like you're in a one-man, you know, little... It's just me, you know, just regular. Yeah, it's regular. Nylon fabric. What? Yeah. Okay, so. You need to push in. As there were some, some, some liberties taken. For well, I imagine. It was a yeah. three person tent, just right. saying. Yeah. So. We should, and we should, oh. <laughs> and since the episode's cut out here, we'll reiterate this. I'll here. send you a picture of my tent pumped or pumped. Yeah. I'll put it up so you can see. The Good. giant Sasquatch hands coming through the tent. All right, let's see your man hands here, Joe. <laughs> what was in that Seinfeld episode where he's a oh, hand yeah, model? Oh, yeah, cracking the lobster. <laughs> right. Jerry's dating the, the, the hand hands. model. Right. Oh, the man hand ones, yeah. Well, you're not that, but it is Jill that is To be the fair, I was wearing a snowboarding glove, and I have it, like, on the... Not fully put right. on, but that was yeah. that was my hand. <laughs> the, the director insisted on bigger hands, and and I only have Jill, so there we go. <laughs> put, well, a put a big old glove on her. Make sure you're loving it. <laughs> yeah. So you're laying in the tent, and it's not Jill's hands, but describe 
Not this time. <laughs> Not this time. Describe what happened. Um, again, alarm's going on. Dog's got me tore up. I'm bleeding my chest, and all of a sudden... You're I'm, bleeding because the dog scratched you up trying to get in the back because he knows something's coming around the tent. She, yeah. She knows, but you said, too, and I want to get back to this here, is that you said when this was walking around your tent, it made a whooshing sound. Yeah, it was making this. <laughs> And it was not touching the tent. There was enough ambient light mm -hmm. um, that I could see uh, anything that would touch the tent. But that because is, I was able to see my dog. Yeah, you know, that is there. the sound that a tent makes. Right. Which makes me wonder whether or not it's mimicking what you're in. You know, mm -hmm. just like this is, this is the name of a tent, whoosh, whoosh. You know, it doesn't know. It's not like we say, let's set up the tent now. We just set it up and it makes that sound. The interesting yeah. thing was that I was talking to a couple of Native Americans about that, and they were saying that's the medicine man make too, that sound. The medicine man makes that sound? Yeah. Okay. I didn't ever hear that one before. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. I, that was kind of, I, I again, hey, yeah. I'm just throwing it out there a big deal, uh, just the way it is, uh, it, what I was explaining nor do I mm -hmm. take any of that in consideration. I just found it interesting. Mm. And I've tried making that sound in my tent, and it doesn't sound it's not like, like that. that. No. Okay. And you did, again, you didn't have a recorder or camera going because you're just a camper. Right. I, I yeah. wasn't even Bigfoot. Yeah. Not at that time. I mean, I didn't. Oh, wait a minute. I'll back up. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I. How do I put this? I did have a recorder there. Yeah. I put it like 60, 50, 60 yards away in a rock. Yeah. So I guess I was kind of Bigfoot, wasn't <laughs> yeah. I? Yeah. I just yeah. didn't really think about it as Bigfoot because yeah. I had the dog with me. First time I've had a dog with me. I never oh. took Cody out in the woods with me yet. So there was something different about that moment. Yeah. You brought a dog. Right. Your dog. That was my daughter's dog. dog. Okay. My grand dog. <laughs> and did you tell Brett that? That you I, had a recorder going? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I was just asking if you yeah, brought Yeah, the interesting any, thing was course. is that recorder recorded the alarm going up, my infrared alarm. It also has something else going on. So while that was going on, my tent with the alarm going off and the wishing noise, which it didn't pick up because I guess it was too far away. Right there at at that recorder, like or in that general area, it was rock ticking. Oh, oh. <laughs> interesting. Wow. Now going back as I explained the story to. Uh, uh, my group, you know, of course, it's pretty fantastic. God, God, you know, how many people have had this happen? It was like, yeah, right, right. To my group. They didn't believe it? No, because I couldn't, I, my recorder, I lost it. So the funny thing was, is when I wasn't looking for it, like a year later, I found it in my backpack, which I forgot I even had with me out there. And so I said, here it is, John. And he goes, holy crap, that's a nine minute. Oh my gosh, that is true. <laughs> so, so there's audio of the clicking, there's audio of the whooshing sound? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we can play that for the audience. I uh, have to find that because it's okay. a funny thing. <laughs> it's, now, here's what happened. You remember that incident when you didn't hit the record button? <laughs> Now mine oh, was I'll never the, forget that moment. But right. Yeah. We'll go, but mine actually recorded where I actually played it to, you know, a bunch of sets of ears, right? Yeah. One night, I had, was out, you know, big footing. I had me recorded sitting on the, uh, close to the fire. Unbeknownst to me during that night, I melted it. <laughs> oh. The original oh. audio's toast. No one made a I, backup. No. So. Oh. Jeez, Meyer. Yeah. Now so, I don't feel uh, like such a 
No. Oh, that's okay. Gunner, <laughs> Gunner got the most awesome audio one night. And he let the recorder sitting on a picnic table. We're out Bigfoot and Shane's, Shane uh, Corson's with us, yeah. Gunner Munson and myself. That was mainly all three of us who always grew up together. Shane and I spent thousands and thousands of hours Bigfoot. Together. Well, and I should mention too, like when I got started in this in like 2008, 2009, your your area, which I thought was Shane Corson and Gunner's area, because they were talking about it. You were kind of in the shadows of doing podcasts and stuff. I never. I got shoved off to the side. You know, I'm the low. I'm the guy that knows stuff. The guy okay. that started stuff. But I'm it was doing... your area, just so people know. Yes. If they ever hear about the Tillamook Research Area, all that crew, uh, which are good guys. I don't have any problem with Shane, or I don't really know Gunner, but. Um, it's good to put a face with the name, and we're not far. We're like 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Is it like on the coast? No, it's not on the beach. It's just okay. the coast and range. Okay. And let's fast forward here because I want people to see the dock. If you haven't seen Larry's story, you need to see this piece here. But as it turns, the Sasquatch makes a whooshing noise. There's rock clicking going on, and then eventually something reaches and touches your head. Just yeah, so I tell people more. So about I'm that. laying on my back, and I'm going. Uh, you know, of course I'm bleeding. My chest is tore, scratched by this dog, so I'm kind of laying in pain. And all of a sudden, I hear right behind my head something that I've not heard before. And all of a sudden, I feel. First of all, I feel kind of like a bump. Well, it's kind of what was that? And I'm not hearing that swishing sound anymore, so it stopped right behind me. And then I'm kind of going, and then I got this bump on the back part of my head. And then I, I start hearing my uh, fabric moving. And it's moving, and the contact. And then the hand manipulates where the bottom of the palm goes all the way to the base of my neck and head and then there's more of this stretchy sound as my fabric is moving and then the fingers are going over my eyebrows and more more of this this uh fabric sound and then it goes the thumb goes around halfway around to my chin and then my head's being maneuvered gently while it's got this gentle, but firm grip on my head. And I'm laying there going, oh, this <laughs> <laughs> So I slowly reach over to my right. I grab my 45. I aim it up to where I think it is. It's still moving my head. I'm going, nope. It's not big enough. And I slowly put down my 45. And it's still, it's moving my head to right and left and, and kind of like, yeah, just move right, right to left. And what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I think, oh, wait. I'll burp my alarm on my truck, my lock feature on my truck, which will make the, the horn beep and kick on my cargo light because that's all facing my tent. Headlights are facing the tent No, too? the cargo light. Cargo light, okay, which is the back end? Where's yeah. the cargo light? Cargo light's right on the back of the cab. Okay, so that's a bright flood light. Yep. Or something like that. So, it's doing it. It's doing its hand cranial massage thing, or whatever you want to call it. I'm freaked out. I'm not going to shoot it because I don't want my ass kicked, for a lack of a better term. And the other deal is, besides the whooshing sound, folks, is I was hearing bipedal footsteps. Okay. And so, go back. I got my keys. I I feel for my. Uh, lock button feature and I hit 
beep, cargo lights on. Hand jumps right, goes right off my, my head. I'm released. And it was quiet for about two or three seconds. Well, after, however long it took, mm -hmm. from the time, from the beep to the time the light shut off, there was silence and I was free. They were stepping away or did it, no, they were just, walking away? No, it just, what it did was froze right there. So let go and froze. Well, yeah, I got that, but did you hear it leave? No, no. How's that possible? Because no. I was going, did, 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 did. <laughs> Oh, you were, you were in hyperspace squeezing the car alarm, burping it. Yeah. So you think that that overshadowed it leaving? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other deal was is that I didn't get into that while it was doing its walk around mm -hmm. thing before, uh, mm -hmm. before, uh, actually where I beat the alarm, it went back to walking around the tent. Oh, it did? You know, okay. I beeped it uh, enough where mm -hmm. it silhouetted its shadow. Mm -hmm. um, I would be where I was laying, where actually its shadow mm -hmm. of went over my tent, so I knew exactly what it was at that okay. time. And then it walked around the backside of my tent where my head was, and it went to my table. It was ruffling around my table. So I had a bowie knife on a cutting board, which was twice the width of this. And it's ruffling around my table, and I was like going, ah. So, you know, I'm going, and I have my food underneath the table, um, underneath the, actually on the table, it was in a cooler. I left home with eight eggs, they're brown eggs, and I am a diabetic, so I have my medicine in a plastic bag, which I put in the paper bag in a milk crate and shoved it underneath the table because it was starting to mess. So, after, I'm just giving you an idea because the next morning was one of those WTF moments again. So, next morning after, the, after I finally got beeped out of there, because I was, I kid you not, I finally was like, he started walking around the tent again, and I'm, had, I, I don't know what I'm thinking, other than this sucks. Mm -hmm. Beep, 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 meanwhile, dog stone in the bag, shivering, or whatever you want to call it. Beep, 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 beep on the alarm, and it melted away, so I never really heard it leave. Probably because I was hitting the alarm so much. Okay. So next morning, I get up, dog bounces out of the bag. She wants to play. I'm sitting, it was like first light. And I'm going, I didn't sleep that night either. So it was like, well, this really sucked. First door of business is coffee. So I had my coffee, and, you know, to put my grounds in my percolator and stop. Got the water going, got my stove going. Make a cup of coffee to, while I'm throwing a stick at the dog because the labs like to fetch. So if I get a cup of coffee and I still think of what a night, you know, dog's like, hey, nothing's wrong. You know, she's just saying, oh, no, I want to play. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this sucked. So I'm drinking my coffee and I'm going, where's my bowie knife? <clears throat> it was right there. And Drinking my coffee, why are my pills on the table? They were milk crate still down there, paper bags laying on the ground. But the pills were taken out of the table and put on the table. You mean just the, the vial? No, they were in a plastic bag, okay. in a paper bag, and a milk crate. Okay, so it separated contents and then put the contents on the table. Yeah. Okay. So there's my pill my pills in this bag. And again and of course they're in their their uh, pill bottle. Mm -hmm. But everything's on the table. And then I'm going I'm drinking a cup of coffee going, Where the hell is my knife? Bowie knives just don't get up and walk away. Well it's on the opposite end of the table, precariously balanced. Just sitting there. Half of it's hanging off the table, half of it's on the table. Is it swaying? You're saying it's precariously balanced like it's, it's balanced like this. Like a teeter totter would do? Yeah, but it's yeah. actually perfectly balanced. And I'm kinda of going, huh. I didn't know that thing was balanced. 
<laughs> that's how you know a good night, though, right? Yeah, but I'm right. going, what's it doing over there? So right. another swig of coffee, right? What the hell? Why is my thermos a jar? I had that shut. Not my thermos, but my, uh, my, uh, cooler. cooler. Yeah. What, what the hell? So I walk over to the other table, kind of flip it open, and I look, and the egg carton's open. Wow. All right. Okay. And so I'm looking, going, I know I left home with eight eggs. Why are there only four left? I knew I left home with eight eggs. I'm arguing with myself at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I only put four in there, but I eat four eggs a day. Why would I do that? So I made myself breakfast and you know, and I was like, you know, don't worry. I don't think I'm going to stay out here another night. Last night sucked. So I packed up everything and left, right? I get the dog out of the truck, got her in the house, and the first place I made a beeline to was the carton of eggs I took the eggs with. Mm -hmm. And there were the other four for a total of 12. Now, we hear this time and time again about them taking only half or a quarter of what they're allowed to. They don't ever seem to, unless it's peanut butter, clean out the contents. There seems to be the nature of saying, well, we're not going to steal outright. We're going right. to leave you something. I think even Arla talks a Arla little bit about, about that, that yeah. as well. Yeah. So that's a consistent thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is there any doubt in your mind about what happened that day? No, I doubt at all. I'll never forget as long as I live. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. matter of fact, going to the primal mind where I kind of live, it didn't mean me any harm. Uh, I think it was more curious. Now, what people don't know about me is I'm more mm -hmm. a, an empathic person than most people. And I've been working on this as, as a theory, is that, uh, or a hypothesis, is I think the more empathic you are along those lines, coupled with uh, learning how to be one with nature, I think you're attracted to that. Um, has that comment got you in trouble with the Bigfoot community? I care less what the Bigfoot community thinks. You know, <laughs> well, this I, is, I, this I, is yeah. me. I mean, that's yeah, my yeah. own personal... Yeah, my I own happen personal. to agree with you, and I, I know you I probably feel that way. You know, but has, is, that got, has that comment gotten you in trouble nonetheless? I just, first time I've ever pointed that out. And really? Yeah. The thing is, is I'm, I'm pretty much of a low-key guy, mm -hmm. and if I'm out in the woods, hey, Bigfoot's just icing. Now, I can't, I said mm -hmm. hypothesis. You gotta make sure you understand that. Hypothesis, yep. mm -hmm. it's not proven, but I think there's merit to it. 100%, 100%. We could keep going here, but I encourage people to see the doc and to come meet Larry anytime he's at a conference. Now, the next conference we're having happens to be the premiere of part two. We're going to be um, showing Flash of Beauty Part 2 and Forks this Memorial Day. I thought I remember you saying you might make yeah, it. Yeah, Kathy, I'm going to be at the OP. Um, so They're having a camp out? Yeah. Okay. So I I might take Kathy and we might go over there. Doing Kathy? The, my wife. Okay. Yeah, so we might go over there. Okay, cool. Forks where? <laughs> <laughs> it's Washington, well, but where It's the forks. last town before you hit the I know. Pacific. Yeah, so. Well, I know where it is. I mean, yeah. It's just down the road from your OP. Yeah. yeah. Convention Center. Yeah, oh, so it's center. going to be at yeah. the Rainforest Conference Center. The Conference Center. And yeah. that's right across from Sasquatch, the Legend Gifts. Uh, come out there, folks, if you get a chance. I know I've talked a lot about it. Um, this episode will have already passed, unfortunately, but still come out to Forks and go <laughs> check out Sasquatch, the Legend. We already had a good time, actually. We always had a great time. Cool. And um, anyway, Larry, I appreciate you redoing this here. Luckily, I did record this interview. So. Let me see. All right, the light is on. It is not blinking. And yeah. let's let's be honest, you guys. It was better the second time around. So it is the, sequel, you know, the, sequel, it's a, the happy accident. 
It's a happy yeah. accident. Yeah. Sequels always it's always better. better in person, too. Yeah. 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 All right. This was fun. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Yep. Thank you. This has been a Resonance Production podcast. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, you can email us at bigfootrevealedpod at gmail.com. Also, if you're just discovering the Flash of Beauty universe, you can watch our documentary on most major streaming platforms.